So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Davina Lyons. I'm the Managing Director of the E-Commerce Club. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon at Bridging the Mobile Revenue Gap. Um, we're doing this event in conjunction with the Fashion Network. Um, they are sitting behind the scenes on this one, um, but um, they are very much sort of involved in the content and uh, and obviously the sort of promotion for today. Um, but also sort of like it's, a, I'd like to say a big thank you to Screen Pages who supported this event. Um, and um, of course, that makes it possible for us to to um, put it on for you um, and to bring together a, a great panel um, to, um, to answer all your questions this afternoon and all of my questions as well. Um, so we want to keep it um, as interactive as we possibly can. Um, so we've got a chat box. Um, so please do um, put any questions or comments um, that you want to actually sort of put in there if you want to chat to each other, um, then, you know, that is a sort of free for all um, within reason, of course, um, for you to be able to, um, to get involved in today's proceedings. Um, and also, um, we are um, putting a recording of this up onto um, YouTube. Um, so, you know, if you do have to sort of dip out at some point, or you've got a colleague, perhaps who hasn't watched it, um, then, you know, please do sort of like go and watch it later we will circulate that link um, and do remember to like it as well um, and share it with sort of you know other relevant people so we've got a sort of number of areas that we want to cover today um, and um, I'll also introduce you to the panel shortly but um, so you know we wanted to actually look at mobile commerce and the pandemic obviously has had a massive effect. So, I mean, we, you know, we certainly want to be touching on that. Um, but we also want to be looking at the future as well, thinking about um, how do you actually sort of maximise the um, ability for people to be able to purchase through their mobile device um, and some of the sort of like options there um, that you should be considering for your business, but also sort of the usability of that as well, you know, making sure that that's actually easier for the easy for the customer to be able to access um, your e-commerce site. Um, we've got a particular focus, obviously, on sort of fashion and FMCG brands. Um, but, you know, we also think learnings from other sectors as well will be relevant. Um, so, you know, we will be touching on sort of other examples and, um, and referencing other brands as well. Um, and again, feel free if you've got sort of like, you know, some particular sort of references that you want to sort of share with everyone, do feel free to put those into, into chat. Um, so without much further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the panel. Um, so they're going to say a little bit about themselves, but also a little bit about, um, you know, their um, current role. So that just gives you a little bit of background and, and as to why we've invited them to take part. So, Paul, I'm going to come to you first. If you can just tell people a little bit about yourself and your background, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Paul McDermott. I've, um, uh, we, we, we were chatting earlier, I've worked in retail and wholesaling now for so long that I've qualified for my uh, for my job. Um I've done a variety of e-commerce and marketing roles over uh, too many decades than I care to remember. Um, and I've worked for businesses such as Great Universal Stores that, that turned into Shop Direct, um, Speedo, Poundland, Cotswold Outdoor and Snow and Rock, uh, and Ryman. Um, and I'm now working at a, a, a kiteboarding apparel uh, brand called Vivida Lifestyle, and this is day three. So um, look forward to learning lots and hopefully sharing some of those, um, some of those experiences. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, you've got like an incredibly long CV, um, but a really nice range of retailers as well, which is one of the reasons why, you know, we thought it'd be really good to, to, to get you involved today. Um, so, um, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, so, Belinda, um, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself and also Coco Bay, if you can. Yeah, um, I am the co-founder of Coco Bay, which um, for those who don't know, it's an online beachwear company. We specialise in swimwear, beachwear, all things holiday. Um, and it's sort of grown. It was, we set it up with a, it's a family, actually. Me and my two sisters set it up when um, we were all in our young 20s in London. Um, now, obviously not in young 20s, but um, have seen 20 years of uh, internet growth and how things have changed. It's been a really fascinating time to be involved in online retail. Um, my previous life before uh, retail was actually marketing. I used to market films for Disney. So it was quite a change to move into the retail 
world. And um, so we are uh, recently looking at various different options of upgrading our website platform and have been working with Screen Pages in doing this. And we'll go on to that later. But um, where we've where we've landed and what solution that we and the decisions that we've made. But I know we're going to cover that later. So I shall leave it there. Excellent. Thanks, Belinda. That's quite a I didn't realise that you'd worked in film before. That's quite a transition. How did how did it kind of come about that you decided to get involved in in, in beachwear retail? Um, we well, it would just been a conversation every summer. We'd go on a family holiday and we all sat on the beach and go, Why is it so hard to find beachwear in, in the UK? And at that point, you couldn't even get a top and a bottom separately for a bikini, you had to get your size 10 or 12. And, um, and this conversation just kept on happening. And one summer on the beach, the three of us, the three sisters, one of whom had just had a baby and was out of work and my other sister was in between doing jobs and said this is the time to do it so that was it got back from the holiday and there was a business plan in my email and then we said so there was no going back from there so oh, excellent. Um, yeah excellent well thank you for joining the retail sector providing <laughs> <laughs> us Brits with some good beachwear <laughs> yes unfortunately not very needed at the moment <laughs> <laughs> no, it will be very soon. It will yes, be very soon. Absolutely. Some in your back gardens again for part of yeah. the summer. We'll definitely be buying your your, your beach wear this year. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, and, and last but not least, of course, Sarah is our um our sort of co-host for today, I suppose. Um if you could just sort of tell us a little bit about you, but I think you've also got some kind of setting the scene to tell us a little bit about sort of you know why um we wanted to kind of get you involved in doing today's webinar. Yeah, so I'm the uh the CEO and owner of uh, an e-commerce agency called Screen Pages, um, we're based in uh, Wisdom in Surrey, and um, we have traditionally worked with a variety of uh, companies, helping them with our, either their direct consumer uh, initiatives in e-commerce or, um, you know, uh, internet-only initiatives, and so on and so forth. So, uh, we're a full-service agency. And uh, part of the reason for doing this webinar is that we've noticed in the past couple of years um, a marked trend towards mobile shopping. Uh, and one of the biggest issues that a lot of our clients have faced is um, that whilst they're getting a vast majority of their traffic coming to their websites from mobile devices, uh, it's a challenge to uh, get those visitors to order. So there's a bit of a, a conversion gap, as we call it. Um, so just a little bit more about screen pages, if you could move on to the next slide for me, please. So we, uh, over the years, have built up quite a lot of expertise in all the disciplines associated with either selling, uh, doing e-commerce to trade, but also to end customers, um, understanding what kind of user experience um, visitors want, depending on what device they're accessing your website from, um, how to sell internationally, um, how to actually uh, integrate your website with the rest of your uh, legacy systems in your business for inventory management and stock control and so on. Um, but also all the disciplines of um, search engine optimization and how to get people to find your brand when they're searching for goods on the internet. Uh, more recently, we've been implementing a lot of what we call uh, our progressive web apps. Uh, and we'll be talking a little bit more about what those are and why brands should consider using them for their e-commerce. Next slide, please. And there's just a final bit on um, who, what are the sorts of companies that we, we work for. Here's just some examples of some of the brands that, um, that we're currently working with and helping them sort of grow their businesses online. Um, so that hopefully gives you an idea of who we are and what we do. Excellent, and, and how long have you been in the sector, Sarah? So I've been working in e-commerce since 2004, so quite a long time. We're all showing our age now, aren't we? Because it's like... Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I started when I was 10, obviously. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, so we've uh, worked with a number of... Uh, I think we've uh, been involved in helping about uh, 380 companies grow their wow. business online. Uh, since since 2004, using a variety of uh, platforms and um, and solutions. So um, you must have seen sort of you know a, a, 
a massive kind of broad range of incarnations of sort of, you know, e-commerce platforms along yeah. the way. From 2004 to 2021 is, is pretty significantly different in terms of what you can, uh, you can achieve even as a small retailer. Yes, I mean, I remember myself t- saying to somebody in 2002 that I would never buy my bananas online. And uh, <laughs> obviously, obviously, I had a lot to learn. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I'm a, I'm a sort of avid user of online shopping, online grocery shopping myself. Yeah. But yeah, over the years, we've seen uh, marked changes in how people shop online, uh, what kind of services they expect from uh, brands when they're shopping online and um and also you know what kind of user experience they want uh yeah. in addition to that we've th- there's been a lot of changes obviously with the pro- proliferation of e-commerce in um how you can get your brand noticed in the search engines like google so we keep abreast with those sorts of changes as well um, and it, with reference to the mobile um the point we initially were building uh, desktop websites and separate mobile websites for brands. Then in 2014, we started building uh, responsive websites, which are sort of stretchy websites that work across all devices. Um, And more recently, we're now building the latest incarnation of responsive, which is progressive web apps. So yes, it changes all the time. I was going to say it definitely has and um, and I remember having a sort of similar conversation about well you know some things you can buy online but how do you buy a pair of shoes online because you can't try them on and it's a you know it, I, it's changed sort of astronomically like I can't imagine that my teenage daughters would consider buying any other way um, than buying online um, yeah. so you know it's definitely changed it greatly um, so I wanted to put the first poll up if we can please Dow um, so just thought it'd be a good idea to get a, a, an idea from the people that, uh, that are listening in to us today. Um, so what percentage of your traffic um, is currently coming from mobile devices? Less than 50%, over 50%, um, or you're not actually sure? Um, so if you could just sort of tick the, the relevant box, that would be great. Um, and we thought that would just give us a little bit of information that will kind of help us lead into our first question. So percentage of traffic coming from your mobile device, um, under 50%, over 50%, or don't know. There we are. So 60% of you say that over 50% of your traffic is coming from mobile, uh, 25% less than 50%, and 15% not actually um, aware of that stat. Um, so, okay, so that's quite interesting. So I think that if we can feed that into sort of first question. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to, to, to come to each of you on the panel um, to actually kind of give us your view of mobile commerce, particularly over the last year. And I know obviously that's been massively affected by the pandemic, um, but, you know, but also sort of maybe thinking about sort of, you know, what it was before um, and, and where we kind of are now when it comes to mobile commerce. So I wonder if we can go to you first, Sarah, as, in, as, um, as you're our sort of, you know, mobile and uh, PWA expert. Um, what do you think the kind of state of mobile commerce is at the moment? Well, it, so... Before the pandemic, uh, it's an interesting point, actually, before the pandemic, it, mobile visits to all of our client sites, irrespective, actually, of what they were selling online, um, whether it was to trade or consumers, was growing exponentially. Um, so many of our um, you know, uh, brands selling to consumers were already seeing an excess of 60% of their traffic coming from mobile devices. Um, we've noticed since the whole sort of pandemic and lock and during the lockdowns that that's sort of uh, not that's kind of um, stayed the same so the growth has not continued and uh, and there are some interesting theories as to why that is some people think it's because people are stuck at home and so they might as well use their desktop computer to buy their bikinis online because their boss isn't there to see them shopping whilst they're supposed to be working I don't know (laughs) but (laughs) But it'd be interesting to see what, whether the trend continues um, once lockdown has lifted. But it's certainly been an exponential growth, um, you know, and, and, and not something that uh, needs to be viewed lightly. Um, and that's across all the industries. 
Yeah, and there's, for, for a long time, we were saying in the industry that this year is going to be the year of the mobile. So is this year going to be the year of the mobile? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> if I had the answer, <laughs> I would uh, be a very wealthy woman. Um, no, but I think that, uh, I mean, certainly it, it's, it's become very obvious uh, to a lot of brands that if they don't uh, offer this uh, sort of easy to use, uh, fast, reliable, you know, uh, experience on mobile devices, irrespective of, you know, the connectivity of the user. So whether they've got they've got 3G, 4G, or 5G, or whatever, or uh, using the Wi-Fi network, um, they need to deliver that experience to them on their mobile devices. Because often, uh, if a customer is uh, coming to a website for the first time, it will be from their mobile device. Uh, whether they then go on to complete the, the, the purchase at a later date uh, is another thing. But their first experience of your brand is likely to be from their mobile device because most searches in Google start out on mobile devices. It's over 85%, I think. So, um, so you know, you really need to make a good impression the first time around, even if they're just at the research stage. You know, so that's, that's something that uh, is going to continue um how much how many purchases actually happen on mobile devices i would expect that to the growth to 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 con the trend to continue after we've dealt with you know the challenges that we're facing at the moment with the pandemic excellent thank you sarah um so paul i'm going to come to you next so what's your view on on mobile commerce over recent months <clears throat> i think i think from, from a retailer's point of view one of the difficulties is that, that is that things have changed so much in the way that we behave over the last 12 months on top of things were changing so much anyway in the way that shoppers behave with devices and mobiles so you know before lockdowns there was enormous amount of change going on anyway with technology with you know 5g was about to really start to take off in the uk and, and so on and then on, and then with such a long period of time in mean, 12 months in in e-commerce land is in digital marketing is like an eternity. It's like dog years almost. So, so 12 months been really quite a long time. The, the pattern of our behavior through a, through a day from, from sunrise to sunset is also really quite different. So it's really, I found it for, for a lot of retailers that I've spoken to, it's really tough to try and pick out which of the changes are, you know, uh, just a, a, the normal natural progression of, of how shoppers are changing their behavior and which of those things that have changed are a direct result of lockdown and then predicting which of them will snap back and which of them will stay is equally pretty tricky so i mean for me look, talking to retailers and, and looking at data that is probably one of the big problems that we've got is, is just figuring out which of the changes are permanent and which of them are a, a temporary certainly um in, in Vivida, while I'm, while I'm still quite young, the, the rate of growth for us, because we're a startup, is enormous. Um, and the growth is much faster uh, on mobile than desktop. Uh, and that's been the case pre and, and during lockdown. <clears throat> but the conversion rate is much lower um, and is declining at a faster rate on mobile. <clears throat> so it, it, it would suggest that, as Sarah's saying, that that we're now using devices really quite differently. Um, and as well as reference to the year of the mobile that uh, people have been talking about for the last 15 years, the year of the tablet came and went and yeah. was a real damp squib um, and never really came at all, actually. So, mm -hmm. so I think that there are some of the problems and there are some of the things that we're seeing. I mean, at, at, at Ryman, the, the time that I was there during lockdown, um, Again, as you'd expect, with a, a business that um, that we use when we're in work mode, um, it, it flipped really quite significantly from it, it was going very, very mobile, and then it flipped significantly and went back to desktop because it, as you'd expect, it's a retailer that we tend to look at when we're in work mode. And now we are using desktops probably a lot more often at home mm -hmm. than we used to. So... Uh, yeah, re really challenging from, from, from an analytical point of view um, and forecasting where we think things are going to be even in the next six months. It's pretty, it's pretty tough. 
Yeah, exactly. So I suppose it's a kind of watch this space a little bit, isn't it, for, for this summer as we come out of lockdown and see how that affects behaviours. Um, I mean, it's never going to go, it's never going to go away, but we don't really know what's, you know, what's how that's going to play out, do we, at the moment? No, it, it doesn't. But I mean, certainly from economically and, you know, you know, and then, you know, if you for an e-commerce manager looking at the KPIs and on a weekly basis and, and picking out the trade highlights, there is definitely that ongo- ongoing trend of the rate of growth of mobile traffic is significantly higher. That you know, that it is growing. And what I've seen, certainly in the businesses I've worked in, is that while the number of transactions are growing on mobile, the conversion rate is lower. But it, and also more interesting is that the AOV is. Is, is, has been typically lower in the in the retailers that I've been involved in as well. <clears throat> so it, it's it's uh, and and I've yet I haven't yet met a retailer that's really figured out to track the behaviour of a person, a user across multiple devices. Mm. You know, between when we're in research mode, in shopping mode, and and, and retention mode, um, I found that really quite tricky. So it's still difficult to figure out the difference between what's going on in a session. And then what's going on from a shopper when we're using these different devices at different times of day as well. That, that problem is still around from what I can see. Yeah. Single customer view, That's that's been some the holy grail for, you know, a number of yeah. years, hasn't it? Yeah. So, Belinda, if I can sort of touch on sort of what's happening with you in terms of mobile commerce, obviously specific to, to Coco Bay, but also if you've got a broader kind of view of what will happen in the industry, what, what have you found over the last year in terms of sort of mobile traffic? Well, during this last year, I mean, we've st- we saw a massive increase pre pandemic in in mobile traffic Um, and that has steadied this year definitely but we're still sort of 60% is Mm. mobile um, just under 60 Um, but the conversion on mobile is much less and actually pre-pandemic and still now we're still looking at half of conversion on on mobile which is why we're looking down that route of improving that and whether that is I mean there's lots there's lots of reasons that it could be personally I I'm in fashion I quite like the idea of sort of I'll be bought in on mobile through marketing but particularly with bikinis and the whole experience of bikini shopping we try and make the whole journey of of buying a bikini kind of part of your holiday so hopefully people sit there with a glass of wine and choose their (laughs) choose their bikini and whether that will change I don't know maybe that is taking your time going through that process it's not a quick buy buying beachwear it's but um it's also to do with probably the mobile experience needs optimizing to make sure that that whole journey is as good on mobile as it is on desktop and that's what we're trying to achieve and it is it is a a real challenge because Mm -hmm. there are very different touch points that you get on desktop to mobile Um, and so yeah it's again going going back to what we were saying it it is it's not so it's just a, a kind of it's not a science don't really see the patterns that are coming through are very obvious in numbers, but the psychology behind them is always a bit more complicated. I think mobile is going to continue to grow. I think at the moment right. it's just, yeah. I, I absolutely agree. Um, I, I'm going to come back to you, Sarah. It'd be useful. Are there any, is there anyone who's really getting it right when it comes to mobile commerce? So if you're sort of thinking about sort of particular brands or or particular type of experience that you think is, is playing out very well? Well, I, I mean, yeah, the most obvious one is Amazon. Mm. Um, so if you're an Amazon uh, Prime shopper, um, you're more likely to shop more often buy more and spend more time on the Amazon site than, uh, you know, if if you've got um, their app on your phone. Um, Mm. So, and you only, users will only sort of install apps on their phone if uh, they believe that they're going to um, use them regularly. So obviously it's, it's easy once you get to the size of Amazon to be successful because you can sell all things to all people and deliver it in some, in some cases the same day. Um, but less sort of well-known brands with a good uh, mobile 
UX are brands like Lancome, um, mm -hmm. you know, the beauty brand. You can sort of buy their products uh, online very easily without uh, needing an app. And that's because they have built that site as a progressive web app. And from brands like that to, um, you know, George at Asda, uh, which is, you know, a sort of a very affordable clothing um, brand. They've also uh, built their mobile offering as a progressive web app and is doing extremely well as a result. So um, it might be worth explaining that a progressive web app is a hybrid between a responsive website and an app. So it allows you to deliver a nice user experience on desktop, but also an app-like experience on, on customers' mobile devices. So, um, so brands looking at doing that are going to be the winners, I think, when it comes to the mobile user experience, because the beauty of uh, the, the benefits of apps are, you know, that you can transact offline. They're very fast, they're very slick, they're built to work to the operating system that they're built for. So if you've got an iPhone, it uses all the built-in features of the, the operating system of the iPhone and so on and so forth. So, you know, it makes sense to try and uh, deliver an app-like user experience on mobile devices, but it's not something that everybody can afford to do. Mm. Uh, so right, so we we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna come back to talk a little bit more detail about the progressive web apps because obviously that's you know one of the main sort of premises of this um webinar was to really you know understand sort of you know what the benefits are and and, and the potential impact on your business. Um so I'm wondering, Paul, is there anyone that you are also thinking actually if I'm looking at sort of mobile commerce experience um or you know generally a mobile experience overall that kind of comes to the top of the list? No, unfortunately, we, we know who the winners are in, in, in this space. Um, and and it's, it, there's a direct link as well, I think, between the retailers that we like to use on mobile, whether that's a, an app or, or if we just decided to, to use a browser. Um, I think, obviously, Amazon have, 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 have got it right with their app, but it's extremely functional. And, you know, we shop Amazon in, in generally in quite specific ways in that we know what we're looking for generally. Um, and it's quite, you know, we, we, we generally we're hunting or tracking when it comes to, to that app rather than exploring and, and having a, a big browsing experience. Again, obvious things like ASOS for me. Um, ASOS have, have done a really nice job with their app uh, in that they continue to add new features to it. It's predominantly still... A shopping app, um, the usability, the ease of use of, of being able to maintain the reasons why we go to ASOS, for example, is, is around choice, that, that enormous list of SKUs. And they they continually do a good job for me of, of being able to present, you know, good search, good navigation, good browsing experience on that app. Um, and um, adding all the extra functionality to the purchase that you can do on the Amazon website, so uh, the ASOS website rather. So, you know, the, the loyalty, the VIP, they, they've they rounded the functionality to be a really close match to what you'd expect from their website. So, so for me, ASOS, I think, is a really, really big winner when it comes to mobile. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think my teenage girls would agree with you, actually, on that one. And, and Belinda, aside from Coco Bay, is there anyone else that you're thinking actually, you know, I love their kind of mobile experience? Um, it comes back to what Paul was saying about functionality, doesn't it? Functionality versus personality is a lot of, a lot of retailers lose that personality um, with apps. There's no one actually that really jumps out in that space for me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. So, I'm um, just, Sarah, I want to kind of sort of go back into the progressive web apps and you've given us a, a brief kind of view there about um, what it is. But I also just wanted to understand sort of, you know, a little bit around the cost of a, a progressive web app and sort of why you, you should be making, you know, that choice rather than another choice. OK, well, it's, it's not just about costs. It's also about uh, flexibility and time to market. So as Paul mentioned uh, earlier, you know, 12 months is a long time in e-commerce. Uh, things move incredibly fast um, and a lot of merchants have also had to change during COVID the, the mix of products that they offer um, to, to customers. Uh, everybody suddenly seems to be in the market of selling loungewear 
there's nobody ever heard of loungewear really uh, unless you're a customer of hush clothing we've always sold loungewear <laughs> but uh, everybody and their dog was suddenly selling loungewear um, or products that you know you could sort of use for a staycation or you know everybody's putting a slightly different spin on on uh, what they have to offer um, so um, so yeah so I sorry apologies I've sort of lost my track um, <laughs> right, so. I was just thinking about so the progressive web apps is that you yes. know why, why so, go down the route really thank you for reminding me yeah so you could as a brand if with uh, very big budgets and a big e-commerce team, etc. You could choose to, you know, like ASOS, build an app, but you need to build an app that works on iPhones, but also on all the different Android devices. So you probably need not just one app, but at least two, possibly four or five apps. So you've got to think about maintaining once you've built those, there's the cost of building them, but then there's also the cost of maintaining five apps. And then let's not forget that you've also got to maintain a responsive website. Um, so suddenly you need ridiculous amounts of people just to upload your latest loungewear product range. So, um, you know, so it's not just about uh, the cost of the initial build, it's the cost of ownership of all of those different uh, sort of offerings um, or channels to market. So the reason that, uh, so building a progressive web app solution, it A, will be a lot cheaper because you're only building one solution that works across all devices, but B, it will be a lot cheaper to maintain as well. So in terms of how much it costs, well, I mean, it really depends on what functionality you want to put into your website, but it would definitely be a lot more cost effective to, uh, uh, to just build one solution that works across all those devices and then maintain one solution uh, uh, moving forward. So um, th I hope that answers your question. Yeah, 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 that's great. I, mean, I think we should put up the um, second poll now, if we can, Dale, um, because we actually wanted to just get a, an idea from um, from our um, listeners that what do you think is the main reason for um, poor conversion rates on mobile? Um, so uh, if you can just fill in your relevant answer here. So what do you think is the main reason for poor conversion rates on mobile, uh, poor connectivity, um, poor UX, CX, uh, small screen size um, or other, um, tick that box and let us know um, the specifics in chat um, if you can. Um, and that will just give us a, a little bit of background as to um, why you think we're getting a lower uh, conversion on mobile. Panelists are allowed to vote as well. Just to let you know. Is allowed to vote? Panelists are? Panelists can as well if they want. <laughs> can we? Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. An outstanding winner. Just let a few more people vote if that's okay, Davina. Yeah, 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 that's absolutely fine, Dale. So I'll um I'll see when you sort of pop that up in a second. Um, but um, but actually, sort of, I'm wondering if we can um pop over to ah, okay, there we are. So oh, well, poor UX seems to be coming out as uh, as the biggest one. Um, small screen size, sort of poor connectivity. Um, fairly sort of similar at about sort of a fifth. Um, and then um, other. Uh, I don't know if you've got any kind of sort of thoughts on that, Sarah. Is, is that generally what you tend to find, sort of like when you're talking to people? Yes, merchants are still sort of catching up in terms of what kind of uh, user experience they need to offer on mobile devices. Uh, it's, it, it's actually shocking how little uh, merchants look at their own websites from a mobile device. Uh, or indeed try ordering from their own websites using a mobile device. Uh, when you think that in some cases they've got more than 6% of their visitors coming to the site from mobile devices, it's actually quite astonishing that they don't sort of try and use their own website to see how it, how it works. Um, so, so, so that doesn't surprise me at all. And um, there are all sorts of things that you need to consider, which is, um, you know, what kind of payment options, sorry, I do apologize, I have to plug in my power source. Uh, what <laughs> no kind of payment options 
you know, you offer a user on a mobile device is really important because that mm. affects the whole user journey. Um, and if it's easy to pay without having to sort of type in my credit card details in, in a really small window using my big fingers, you know, um, and potentially get my credit card out in public, which I wouldn't want to do necessarily either. Um, you know, you need to think about all of those things. So it doesn't surprise yeah, so me at all, actually. Question. This is where things like Apple Pay, PayPal and so on will win out because it's just a quick, you know, touch of a, a click of a button. Absolutely. So uh, that, that, uh, that poll uh, doesn't surprise me at all. We have a question I've just noticed from one of mm. the attendees um, asking uh, what increase in key metrics uh, you would expect to see uh, with an app or a progressive web app versus a standard yeah. responsive website. Um, so your speed is the obvious one, um, but also if they have an app or a progressive web app, it will likely be on their, the home screen of their phone. So they're more likely to go there if they're on the market or looking for something that you have to offer. Uh, so you're going to get more repeat purchases as well. Uh, yeah. So typically... And this is true of apps and progressive web apps. They spend more time, they buy more, and they bounce out of the, your website less frequently. Um, so, I mean, I think those are probably the most important metrics, yeah. Mm. Uh, Thank you, Mark, all, for that question. Yeah. Yeah, and there was another one as well from um, Hamida, um, who was asking... Um, when you're working with the brands, how do you uh, deal with the challenge of search results on mobile? Yeah, so it, it, the, one of the most important things that determines, uh, if we're talking about how you can come top of Google in the Google search results, then obviously you need to meet as many of Google's requirements as you possibly can. So uh, if you have an app, Google can't see your site, so it's not going to rank you at all. So that's a, that's a big issue, and that's part of the reason why progressive web apps are, are becoming increasingly popular. And then it's about so it's about Google being able to find you and find all the lovely things and wonderful things you do. But secondly, it's about how fast is your website, and then thirdly, how usable is your website? And Google will rank you on that basis. So mm -hmm. you've got to sort of try and hit as many of those uh, goals as possible. Uh, in order to rank better than your competitors. Um, so it's not just about improving the UX uh, for the end customer, it's also allowing them to find what, what it is that you do by ranking well in Google in the first place. So um, if you're talking about search on the actual device itself, um, that's a whole other ball game. You've obviously got to have a very easy to use search feature on your we website or app. Uh, irrespective of what technology you're using, uh, especially if they're coming from a mobile device and especially if you have a lot of different products because um, they're not going to be able to navigate around your site as easily as they would do on a desktop. So okay. search is extremely important. Excellent, thank you. I think it's a good time to bring in poll three as well now, Dale, if we can. So um, what do you think is most cost-effective, PWA, app, mobile responsive site? Uh, Sarah might have given you some indication on this, but um, what do you think is most cost effective? PWA, an app, a mobile responsive site, um, or you haven't got a clue? So if you can just tick the relevant. We can, can we vote again, Dale, panellists? Yes, you can. Yay. <laughs> this one looks a bit more neck and neck. Yeah, you know, you know I'm a joiner in her. <laughs> <laughs> Don't like to miss out. <laughs> Cool. So if you can choose the relevant answer, that would be great. Um, has everyone voted now, do you think? Pretty much. I'll just launch it now for you. Lovely. Okay, so mobile responsive site, uh, people believe is the most cost effective. Uh, PWA sort of coming in um, at 32% as opposed to the 45% there. Does that surprise you, Sarah? Oh, you're still on mute, Sarah. <laughs> Apology. Uh, that does surprise me. And it's probably a, 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 an education thing. So yeah. 
because PWA is relatively new, uh, and they're not that new actually, uh, the concept was uh, jumped up by Google in 2015 as a way of building mm -hmm. websites, but uh, um, very few small to medium sized brands are actually aware of what a PWA is. And as a result, uh, there are not that many agencies offering uh, to design and build uh, progressive web apps with the, the skills in-house. So, um, so it, 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 it may be that certain agencies are charging more because it will take them longer to do because they haven't done it as much as built responsive mm -hmm. websites. But so that, that's more about who you choose and what platform you use. Um, rather cost. Yes, it's not. Yeah. Uh, choose an agency that knows what they're doing. Put it this way, it costs no more to build a new website as a PWA than it does to build a website as a responsive website from our point of view. Yeah. So Belinda, this is a good point to bring you in actually, because um, I know that obviously uh, you've been working with Sarah. Um, so, you know, from your point of view, you, obviously you already had a website, you already had, I'm assuming some kind of mobile responsive site. Yeah. You know, what did you then do with your existing kind of setup and how did that then sort of progress into the new app? Or well, we, need, we needed to upgrade anyway because the platform we were on come to its life end. So um, we were just exploring all the options at that point. Budget was a big factor, <laughs> um, but also to make sure we had something future proof and nothing's future proof we've already discussed how quickly e-commerce moves but we didn't want to be doing something and then in, in a year's time think oh I wish we hadn't done well we'd gone down that route instead of this route the other thing for us which was a major factor because um we are as our product range increases SEO is becoming more and more important to us and we got hit quite badly by the move to the sort of mobile first um from Google and our, so our SEO agency is this is like it's, it's mainly about speed so that for us was a, a big factor about what what platform we go on speed had to be number one of our priorities and um, so yes talk to a lot of people a lot of agencies and I didn't know what a PWA was at that point either so I ended up talking to Sarah who said you know have you considered going down this route and I did a lot of research she was very informative and um, we came to the conclusion that for what we were looking for it was um, a it was going to tick the boxes that that we we needed but also from a budget point of view it, it did come in um, where we wanted it to be and we did um, Sarah can go into the more technical side of it but by using a um, a sort of combined PWA with Magento and it's like a what would you call Sarah's store view storefront is a, a sort of platform isn't it that does right. PWA yeah. it took some of the design costs out of it by using a template so that was a huge help as well mm -hmm. so yeah that was our our kind of um main thing and what's really interesting we're still at staging stage at the moment we mm -hmm. um are hopefully launching very shortly but we did, our SEO agency did an initial audit yesterday in staging and the results that came through from that for a first stage audit were way better than they would expect from a normal responsive site. So that was really encouraging. Really? Yeah. So, so, so kind of to you is telling you that actually you think you're going to get a knock on benefit in terms yeah. of kind of coming up the sort of search results. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. So, Paul, um, it'd be useful to get some ideas from you as to um, because you've worked at multiple retailers. And I remember you saying to me the other day that even at Poundland, they were considering having a mobile app, which yeah. surprised me quite a lot. So, tell me about you know when you're starting this process. Like, do you actually go? Have you gone mad? You know, what happens when you what you've got to consider when you're thinking about mobile commerce? Um, I, I joined Poundland in 2012, which seems like an eternity ago. Um, and uh, one of the very first things that I did, I, I was only in the job a couple of weeks. Um, a, a quite a typical story, really, of, of we probably, a lot of it's familiar, it's a familiar story to a lot of us in that you know, I, I joined the business and they had 
too few people, bums on seats, looking after too much work. Um, there was one person who was responsible for a UK website and an Ireland website. And then on top of that, someone in the boardroom, uh, in their infinite wisdom, decided that the business needed an app. So therefore, they had an app. Um, and nobody was looking after the app. Uh, the app didn't do anything particularly clever or special. Um, and to Sarah's point about, you know, retailers inside a business, looking at your own properties, looking at your own mobile websites and so on. I spent time just looking at the reviews of, of, the, of, this, of the app on both platforms um, and they were awful. They were, there were dozens and dozens of, of one-star reviews. Um, and I quote, I'm giving it one star because there isn't a no star option. <laughs> and, and the damage to a brand that that does is it's, it's horrific. Um, on top of layering cost and complexity internally and in, in trying to maintain and manage it. So, um, I mean, the starting point really for any brand or retailer is, is why, what's the point? What's the point to the business of, of adding this extra channel, this extra complexity, this extra way of shopping? What's the point to the business? And what's the point to the customer? Um, and if there's a tangible point, sounds like a good plan. And if there isn't, or if you're responding to the hippo, um, then maybe somebody needs to broaden the shoulders and you know and, and have an honest conversation about it. That's always it's always the best starting point. And so, when you're actually thinking about your sort of mobile commerce strategy, are there like a you know a number of areas that you think, okay, well, I'm putting this together. I've got to kind of think about this. I've got to think about X. I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd I'd recommend starting with a customer um, first of all, and and uh, which sounds. It sounds ridiculously easy thing to do, and, and unfortunately, too few of us start with the customer. The, the statistics of, of customer behaviour, certainly by age or by the, the the typical, you know, Gen Z, millennial, the way that we use mobile in particular is really significantly different. So, for example, some some stats I was reading the other day, um, do some homework for this. Forty five percent of Gen Z are using mobile as a digital wallet for all kinds of payments, whether they're going to the co-op or whether they're buying online. Um, for millennials, that's down to 35%. And for Gen X, it's 28%. So it's, it's just a really quick snapshot of starting with a customer because depending on what your brand and business is about and then who your customers are, how you split them down by segment, why they're coming to you, that will give you an awful lot of clues about about what your plan should look like and, and where you should be spending your money and where you should be investing, you know, hard in time and effort. It's starting with your customer. Um, yeah. And you know, the other irony is that it's so cheap and easy now to poll customers. With, you know, lockdown has shown us that, that this technology of this new fan-angled Zoom and video, this technology has yeah. been around for bloody ages and here we are now using it like we didn't used to 14 months ago. Polls is a great example that polls, uh, customer polls and customer surveys are extremely quick and cheap ways of, of finding out information that you, and your customers will be willing to tell you. So I'd recommend that there are a couple of really good starting points. Mm, absolutely. I know you're getting a number of questions in, in chat, Sarah, uh, you know, talking, asking to clarify on the sort of progressive web apps. Does it actually replace your mobile app? Um, you know, is it sort of as well as? Um, so I don't know if there's anything else that you want to kind of sort of respond to sort of generally to everyone on, on you know, where it kind of fits into the puzzle. Yeah, so it's, it's very confusing if you don't know what it is. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we have a, just a couple of things. We have a white paper on our website, which is there, which kind of explains it in a very simplistic way. Uh, it, it's, uh, so it's not technical or anything. It doesn't go into a lot of detail and it gives some examples. But basically... A progressive web app is the be it, it, it's a sort of hybrid between a normal responsive website and an app. So, uh, so that's why it's called a progressive web app, basically. Uh, it's just a slightly different way of building websites so that it will sort of allow you to do app-like app -like things on, on mobile devices, like send push notifications, transact offline, and all of those, and have a very fast user experience. It will also get, deliver a fast user experience on desktop, um, uh, but obviously you wouldn't necessarily use push notifications on desktop. So it, it's a hybrid, 
it's the best it's it's the hybrid of both things so you can actually tick off all of those boxes as a merchant and uh, and for those customers that want to have an app like experience they can get that and customers who just want to shop on their desktop devices can get that too but you as the merchant only have to have one website and it does all of those things for you and what Excellent. if we can interject Davida yeah you know, one of the things that that we've got to remember or think about is you know well well who who's using the PWA? And we were chatting about this when, when we had our, our, our conversation earlier this week. Um, and I, and I was because starting off with PWA, I'm like, oh, bloody hell, I can't talk about PWAs. What's that? I don't even know what one is. Well, I use them all, all the time, every day. Pinterest is a PWA. Um, Spotify is a PWA. Uber, when we used to go out in taxis, is a PWA. So we're using them all. The Starbucks is a PWA. So there are a couple of really interesting things that we need to think about with these. I think from a from a retailer and inside a brand is that uh, you know first of all is that for the customers we're using them all the time and we don't know. That would mm-hmm. suggest that the technology is pretty good. Um, yeah. And when smart people who are spending lots of money in, in these organisations are using them, it's probably for for good reason too. Um, for the rest of us with much smaller budgets, we've got to really think carefully about will the customer get benefit? Yes, no. And is is the business going to get a better result with either less cash investment or less time? Uh, that's either less time to build or less time to manage and maintain, less time to spend in, in, in getting stuff done and not having two and three and four versions of the same thing. So because PWA, without understanding the technology, in great detail, it's going to give retailers and brands the flexibility and the speed to to do more development much more quickly, much more effectively without as much admin burden, admin management and overheads. So it's something that we've all got to really think about and look at really carefully because Mm. the, the pressure that retailers are all going to be under is going to grow because customer expectations are, 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 have, have gone through the roof over the last 14 months. So yeah. because we're using them all the de- all the time, it's not something that we need to be too scared about. Mm. And I suppose, Belinda, that kind of brings us back into, you know, to your journey is that, you know, for you, the, the reason you chose the PWA is because it seemed like a cost-effective way um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but a cost-effective way of you kind of sort of, you know, future-proofing your business. Were, were, yeah. were there any other factors yeah. that played in that? But also, going back to what Paul was saying, for a, a lot of our customers who've been with us for years, I didn't want to create something that was too different. So mm. the fact that what a lot of customers won't notice that difference they have a better user experience, it will be faster, but it will still look like a responsive website if they're if they're using it online and they're not great app users so I, I think that was a real appeal about it as well um yeah because you're not asking them to perform you know an action no i wouldn't no. even know it's a impressive yeah. web okay yeah and also we don't have the frequency um so for example yes we do have customers who come back and back but it's you know it's not sort of a, a weekly purchase so um so it was kind of taking that into account as well um but yes and just a, a trying to address that that conversion gap that we had with mm. between mobile and um desktop so, so what we need is we need to get you back in a couple of months Sarah, yes months. to get you to come and say yes with lots of <laughs> graphs <laughs> stats say, like I the value enough and we got this massive conversion and yeah. <laughs> our search yeah. rentals that you know, went yeah. through the mobile it sounds like it's about to be an exciting time actually yeah. um, on that score. so what I'm, go on so what i what you know what we're seeing which is um when it was one of the moments because we wanted to keep it very visual and we've managed to retain all that side within it as well so that's been really because that was a very big priority for us as well yeah absolutely so I mean I think that kind of brings us nicely we've got sort of a, a five minutes six minutes to go um as into you know what do we feel the sort of future is for you know for both sort of PWAs I suppose and also for for mobile commerce so um, I don't know maybe if we can come back to um, you first Sarah um, and just give us kind of a view as to 
what you think will will happen with sort of mobile over the next year or so? So yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm certain that the trend towards uh, mobile will will continue. Um, it's obviously a much bigger trend for with uh, products like you know um, fast moving consumer goods and fashion and things like that. But it's it's applicable to businesses as well. So even if you're you know having to buy um, you know equipment for your um, uh, your sort of plumbing business uh you often will be on site and you will want to be able to order a, a part that you need for the particular job you're doing for a customer in an easy way without having to wait till that evening and get it delivered the next day and you might need to do that on a building site where there's very poor connectivity so so i think it's it's right that um that all uh, people doing e-commerce all companies doing e-commerce think about how it is focus more on the experience for the end customer using a mobile device and then it's about like paul said what what is it you're trying to achieve so if you want to rank better than your competitors in google then you know how can you deliver the fastest user experience so that's not just good for your customer but it's also good for you because you'll rank above your competitors in the search engines for products that that they sell similar to yours um or, you know, is it just about uh, improving the user experience because it's not as good as it should be on, uh, on mobile devices and speed is not so much of an issue because you're selling to your trade customers. Um, and so you don't need to necessarily worry, worry about SEO as much as you would do if you're selling to consumers. So, so it's really about what, what are you trying to achieve? But progressive mm. web apps are effectively the new way of building websites. Uh, and in the same way that back in 2015, building responsive websites became the, became the norm, this is going to be the new norm. So as Paul said, as well, you're already using progressive web apps in all areas of your life. It's just that this has now become something that small to medium-sized merchants are considering for their businesses because it can be done cost-effectively and, and, uh, and it will be good for them for a number of different reasons. So, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I know you've got to kind of sort of dip out on time. So um, I do want to say sort of thank you very much for, um, for joining the panel. Thank you very much for supporting today. Um, and we will also obviously um, be sending around an email. Thank you email to everyone um, with the recording, um, but also with contact details for you um, so that they can sort of, you know, get in touch or they can reference any of those materials that you mentioned. So, so right. thank you very much. I'll, I'll depart now. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Sarah so um Paul if we can come to you quickly um so you've got a, you've got about a minute each actually Paul and Belinda um so if you can just give us your kind of sort of one minute view on on you know what's next in in terms of sort of mobile um that would be great Paul, um, yeah. what what I think what uh, there's a few things that we've, we've we've got to look out for I think one is is um the uptake of 5g because it's going to make devices faster when we're out and um uh, the the second thing to look out for is how our behavior or how our audiences and our customers behavior is going to change really really quickly probably sometime from june onwards maybe even a little mm -hmm. bit earlier and when we take the fact that we are probably all going to go absolutely nuts in the uk at least and be outdoors a lot more often with a mobile device that probably there'll be more of them on 5G, then the, the amount of time that we're using mobile is going to increase and our expectations that we're using a website that's dead fast on our new swanky mobile device while we're outdoors is, is going to accelerate enormously as well. So yeah. we, we, we've got to think really carefully about where we invest in, in that mobile user experience because, because customer yeah. expectations will be massive. I agree. Thanks, Paul. And that's a nice segue to you, Belinda, because yeah. whilst we are out and about more on our fancy mobile phones, using our very speedy progressive web apps, we'll be coming to Coco Bay and buying yeah. lots of websites. We're having a great website experience, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so, interesting. So you know, I never watch this space, isn't it? But is yes, there anything? It is. But I would, I totally agree. I think yeah. um, user expectation is going to, I mean, and we're already seeing it. People are spending so much time online on Zooms, Zoom meetings at the moment that 
everyone's got a slightly um, sort of higher expectations than they would have done a year ago because their tolerance is is a bit stressed. So I think, um, yeah, it'll be it'll be an interesting time, and I think we'll see a, a huge um, sort of increase in in users again online. Brilliant. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Well, that was perfect timing. So. <laughs> So thank you very much for um, for joining us today, Paul and Belinda. I know we've already said thank you to um, Sarah and thank you very much to the screen pages, of course, for um, supporting. When we send out the thank you email, um, you've both agreed that uh, you're happy for us to include your um, LinkedIn profile. So if anyone wants to kind of set, you know, connect with you or message you on LinkedIn, um, then um, they're welcome to do so. If there's any particular follow up, I know there were a few questions and so on being directed at you during the webinar. Um, and um, and of course, please share the the you know recording as well. Well, if you want to share it with any other kind of friends and colleagues who might be interested so right. thanks very much enjoy thank your you. afternoon thank you okay. thanks everyone bye bye, bye. 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 Thank you, everybody. And if you are watching or listening to this on YouTube, please uh, click like and subscribe so you will hear about our future webinars. Thank you. <laughs>